I was able to interview John Schlesinger because Rock de Mer, a French Canadian, had turned the Montreal Film Festival into one of the top festivals in the world. And when Schlesinger was invited to screen his latest film, Darling, at the 66th Festival, he accepted with alacrity. A year later, Warren Beatty chose the Montreal Film Festival for the world premiere of Bonnie and Clyde, one of the great films of that decade. Schlesinger started out as an actor, moved into directing, first on television, where he worked on Danger Man, and then into film, where he distinguished himself with a list of films as different as The Kind of Loving, Midnight Cowboy, and Far From the Madding Crowd. He never shied away from controversial subject matter, and Darling, with its nudity and sexual content, was very much a John Schlesinger subject. I asked him whether he tried to inform educate or entertain? Oh, I think it's terribly important. Um, I mean, to entertain, but my reading of the word entertainment means to, to, to hold the audience's attention. It doesn't mean that awful, well-worn British phrase, family entertainment, which means escapism. Entertainment, I think it's important to realize that we are making films for a public. Uh, I don't mean by that that you have to play down to the public, nor should you. Um, I think that the money boys who back films underestimate des desperately the, the intelligence of a public. And time and time again, films have been made, which they said never should or could be made, which have attracted a public to them. Um, on the other hand, we are making films for each other, as it were, for people to, to go and watch and pay attention to. I don't, uh, uh, at the same time, I'm not a, I don't regard it as a platform which primary, primarily operates uh, as a sort of lectern. Um, I think if one has things to say, then there are ways of saying them um, so that they are implicit in, in the film without making them uh, the reason for making the film. And I, I think that in each of my films, I hope that my feelings about people um, have come out of, have, have come out of the film and communicated these, th these ideas. Um, it's difficult for me to say, you must say, whether you feel anything comes out when you see the films rather than me try to say, I believe this, that, and the other thing. I do, but I'm not wildly militant, I put it that way, about I'm not a politician. Mm -hmm. On the subject of a kind of loving, you had some, um, I suppose what they call, uh, new expression scenes in it, the, the love scenes and the tri and some of the subject matter. Uh, when you come to do these, were you terribly aware of the um, controversial nature of these scenes? Well, uh, I, what, what do you mean by controversial nature? You mean the fact that we were talking about contraception, for instance. The censor made us feel as if we were being controversial by saying, we'll never let that through before we made the film. He did let it through in the end, because I think always, finally, it's a question uh, about how you actually communicate something. I don't think I've ever deliberately done something for sensational reasons. Um, no, well, the uh, part was the, um, if you like, the seduction scene where the actress is seen without or any clothes on. Well, this is very old hat, isn't it? I mean, it's old. Well, I wouldn't say it's as completely old hat. Like the the uh, openness of the treatment, and what I'm trying to find out from you is, when you are actually making these scenes, um, aren't you terribly aware that this is uh, these are going to cause some kind of sensation? That um, these will be pointed out in, if you like, the uh, the mass media as being the hot bits. Well, yes, I'm sure that that is true. I don't actually, as I'm doing it, I don't say, oh, well, actually, perhaps I do now. One says, this will be the poster. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we all have a joke about that and say, well, all right, well, now we've got a good poster for them. But it's done <laughs> with great cynicism when I say that. I, don't, I, I certainly never deliberately try and be sensational. I just believe in freer speech. Uh, there are a mass of things that we discuss much more openly in our daily lives. We read about it in the press openly. 
we see franker discussions now about all sorts of controversial matters on television. Um, and I see absolutely no reason why we should not become a little more liberal-minded in the cinema. In Darling, we go as far as we dare um, with a number of things, which if you're coming to see the film this evening, you'll see. Perhaps you've already seen it, I don't yeah. know. Um, which has caused us trouble, a um, certain amount of trouble with the censor. Uh, and I'm sick and tired of people, for instance, saying that you can show, oh, I don't know, some form of perversion or other, provided you make a joke of it. You know, James Bond, you're allowed to show um, a lady making a pass at another lady, for instance, whereas if you do uh, try and investigate the subject very seriously, people say, ah, well, that puts a different complexion on it. You know, you're now dealing with something that is uh, very difficult for us to accept. Well, I think this is just nonsense. And... Um, I hate this sort of blinkered attitude to things. I believe that we are all able now to speak more freely about what goes on in the world and the effect it has on each other, and that we should do so, provided it is done for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever been completely satisfied with any film that you've made? Not really. I think I once made, a, certainly never none of my full-length films, um, they're made under too much... Making a film is really... It's like having a baby in a sort of way, you know. It's a very traumatic experience. And um, um, I found that I think only once in, in all th 25 television films did I make something which I look back on now as being successful. It set its target and it achieved what I'd set out to do. I mean, I always have pet bits in each film, but I'm critical of it and wish to redo bits of it long before the public or the critics ever see it. Mm -hmm. When did Darling open first, Mr. Schlesinger? Well, it, it f the first audience it played to was to 6,000 uh, rather bewildered Russians, I think, in, in, at the Moscow Film Festival. Um, and it was shown there about three weeks ago in the Kremlin. And what was the reception? Very hard to tell. They were terribly attentive. And uh, the soundtrack was taken down on the, you know, in volume, so that they could smother the whole thing in a Russian commentary. I understand they translated the dialogue pretty literally. Um, I have a horrid feeling that the Russians were rather anxious to show it because they could make propaganda out of it. It is a fairly hard-hitting film about British decadence. Um, and... Um, well, not any British decadence either, just about European decadence. And, and uh, although this isn't the point of the film, it's there. And I suppose they made capital out of this. I don't know. I was not there sufficient length of time to really find out what everybody said about it. You know, normally I'm anxious to know what the reviews are like and have them translated, but it really was impossible to find, to find out. I talked to interpreters in the the festival who liked it, some of, some of whom loved it, some of whom hated it, but this is going to be the reaction everywhere. Mm -hmm. How about its English premiere? It doesn't open in England till September. It's just opened in New York this week. In New York this week? Yes, it's just opened in New and York last year. what kind of reception did you have? Well, very, very encouraging, for, uh, you know, really, really more than that. Um, it's been a, a big success, um, and it's sort of fascinating to see for the first time, a film being sold in a big way. Uh, uh, it was bought um, after it was finished by Joe Levine. Um, and uh, we needed the money pretty badly at that stage because we'd gone over budget. And uh, we needed someone to show faith in this film after a lot of people had turned it down originally to, for backing it. And so um, we were pleased that he made an offer for it and took away all our financial responsibilities. And it's ex just extraordinary for me to, to find, you know, two pages taken in the New York Times last Sunday or a whole page this Friday uh, with all the quotes. And they are nice quotes, I must say, because the press have been very good to us. 
And uh, I've never come across, though I'm sure here it's a common practice, that the one bad notice we received in one of the New York Daily Papers, which fortunately for us wasn't too important, um, they promptly the following day took half a page and printed the whole of the Herald Tribune rave in its place, which is... Um, well, I'd call that chutzpah. <laughs> <laughs> I, but it's something I, I one enjoys seeing something sold that way, and um, and the public are going, and and uh, the office at Embassy Pictures in New York is a bit like Wall Street or a general election because they're checking on the takings every quarter of an hour from the cinema. It's very fascinating. I've never really been concerned quite so much. I've never been, first of all, in New York when a film of mine's ever opened here. And I've never had this sort of treatment with a film of mine before. I, I have a horrid suspicion that it may go better at New York than it will in England because the British press aren't over keyed about something that's been a hit somewhere else, which is their own product. I think the, the I think we may find they're a little more critical. How do you feel on these first nights, Mr. Schlesinger, with one of your films about to open and uh, with so much of um, you and uh, your actors and uh, somebody else's money involved? Well, it's a strange feeling. I, 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 having just done a play, it's nothing like the same nervous tension as a first night in the theatre because a first night in the theatre... You know, it's the first time you really hand it over to the actors and the stage staff to do the show without you being able to rush up with a little notebook and say, please do this or that. Uh, and anything can happen. I mean, the only thing that can happen in a, in a, in a, has happened, in fact, at the New York premiere was that the projector wasn't um, absolutely projecting the, the right shaped screen, you know, the racking, if you know what I mean by that, wasn't totally correct, but nobody else would notice that. It was only little things like that that you can fuss about. The actual emotion, obviously, one is nervous, but... Um, I think that the first time you ever show a film, when you ever see a film, after you've dubbed it uh, and put all the sound on, which is the first time you really see that baby in its christening clothes, if you like, um, that is the first time that, that you wonder, God, have I done it all right? Um, and then, of course, when it goes to an audience for the first time, I have shown it to an audience before. We'd had a, a marvellous sort of friend, group of friends. We tried the film out on in London. So I knew the film with a certain sort of audience goes all right. It was just a question of whether this audience would take it. The film doesn't change, although, funnily enough, it always appears to with different audiences. I mean, I'm nervous now because in precisely half an hour it's about to be projected at the, at the festival here. I'm always nervous. I'm always also aware of the things that are wrong with, with, with it. Um, the, the only time I really get pleasure out of seeing a film is uh, when you go to just an ordinary movie house with an ordinary audience who don't realize you're there and it isn't an occasion and uh, uh, if they're the right, if you're in the right area where you think, you know, it may go, that's marvelous if it goes well. This is probably, what, your third or fourth big occasion audience. Can you bear to sit right through the whole film again? Well, I don't know if I'm going to quietly withdraw. It depends where, where my seat is. If I'm sandwiched in between high-powered members of this festival, I shan't be able to get out. It's a form of awful incarceration. <laughs> I sort of wondered if I wouldn't go next door and see Von Ryan's <laughs> Express <laughs> during, during the projection of the film. But one is still curious to see particularly in something which has a certain amount of humour in it, whether an audience is going to get it and how it goes. Um, I'm curious to see whether uh, this festival audience in Montreal will like it. Um, I hope they do, but it's, it just is. A, an, an, and a New York first night, which was full of very high-powered high people of the, the industry, um, you know, as I saw them come in, I thought, my God, they're, they're going to be a dreadful audience. They're a very tough-looking crowd. And they were. They were tough in terms of... It wasn't a ball all the way. You know, they didn't laugh as much as I hoped they might. But they didn't get it quite. I think it's got to be a pretty withered audience who gets the humour in this particular film because the humour isn't uh, very palatable always. Mm -hmm. um, you've been an actor. You work with actors. How can I... Uh, how creative can an actor be 
with the director? I think it depends. I think you can be very creative if the director provides the atmosphere in which to create. I think that's really one of the functions of a director, is to create the working atmosphere in which together you allow something to grow. It's a collaboration very largely. What happens when the uh, actor's conception differs from the director's conception or interpretation? Well, I've been very lucky and found that um, I've worked with actors whose conception of the part is the same as mine. Obviously, they, along the road, may differ. Um, and I'm always one for thinking, particularly as I was an actor, that the actor has a contribution to make. Um, and it isn't, even if they're typecast, as they are very often in the cinema, uh, it isn't just a question of saying, do this, do that, you know. There, there are means of suggesting to actors things that they should do so that at the end, really the, the clever thing, I think, is to try and suggest to them so they, they come out thinking that they've thought of the idea themselves. I think this is the way to handle actors. They're, they are a strange breed of people. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a pretty strange profession standing up there night after night making an exhibition of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's, it's a question of, of, of creating the right atmosphere and collaborating in the right way. Every actor has a different approach that you have to make with them. I mean, it's, if it's necessary to get angry and get tough with an actor, particularly if they're, they're self-indulgent in some way, um, then I do. But I don't personally like to work in disharmony. I think it was um, Hitchcock who said that all actors were children and had to be treated as such, and other directors called actors just puppets, and it's up to the director to pull the strings. Uh, what do you think of those two opinions? I think there's an element of truth, possibly, in the cinema uh, with this. There's an element of truth, but I don't really go along with the idea. I don't think actors are just puppets. I think very often intelligent actors, and there are intelligent actors, they're not all children, uh, an intelligent actor can make indeed a, a valuable contribution to not only his or her performance but to the, therefore the whole film um, I, and nor do I think they're just puppets obviously you have greater you have finally the total power and the total say is what's rather nice about the cinema because you are choosing how you are going to present them um, you know and it differs of course in the theatre uh, but uh, with a pair of scissors works wonders, as does a, a long focus lens or a certain sort of lighting or whatever it may be. Um, and this, this is how very often, as we know, performances have been created of great magic uh, by these artificial means when originally perhaps the actor or actress has been known not to have great talent but an extraordinary personality. I think that it is um, very often the case that someone has something which is indefinable for the cinema and makes a great star without being able to be able to repeat the same process in the theatre. Mm -hmm. um, over the last few years, British actors and, and British films have very much come into their own. Um, act, British actors and actresses have, are in practically every big movie that is now made and British films, that is, those made by British directors and writers, are set in trends. Why has this happened? I w are we setting trends? I w um, would like to think that occasionally we are, but um, I think we've set trends before. I mean, I think there was a time when the British cinema was even more productive perhaps than it is now. I mean, there are a few people who are working with greater freedom than ever before in the cinema now. They're not enough, and I don't think our output is quite enough. It's all to do with the whole climate of working all together, I think, in England at the moment. Um, but I think that in the heyday of Lean and Carol Reed and the heyday of Ealing, trends were being set of a certain sort. And I think that after the war, with the emergence of writers, like Osborne and other writers from industrial backgrounds, there came a sort of film to be made which took a, a longer, harder look at, at life in the raw. Um, 
than hitherto had been acceptable because people wanted to escape in the cinema. Uh, now I think there's a big sweep away from this. I think that um, trends are being made, fashions are being set, uh, and they're dangerous things very often. I mean, at the moment, the great fashion, of course, is uh, the sort of inconsequential, um, mad, delightful film like the Beatles films or the James Bonds, which are hugely entertaining, and I adore them. But um, I would not like to think that, you know, we were all out of date yet taking a serious look at people, which is what I'm personally interested in. I feel that uh, while Carol Reed at that time were doing good stuff, I think they were still very much overpowered by the Hollywood um, output. <coughs> Whereas now, not only are films like... Um, a kind of loving, sporting life. That was at the but end of a long the line. That was an end of a long line, kind of loving, alas. That's why, uh, you know, it, it, it came at, a, at the end of a line of films that had already been made about about people in the industrial law, realistic films like Taste of Honey and, and uh, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning. You know, I, uh, obviously they were all lumped together, though one doesn't like that. Um, and I think, let's face it, that the, the present trends in the cinema have still been set elsewhere. I don't think the British are great innovators in the cinema. I think that we're, we're just learning to liberate ourselves a little. Um, uh, but I think the French and Italians still still are at the pip to pip pip us by a long way to the post, uh, really, in terms of technique and in terms of freedom. I think what I've seen of, for instance, we've got nothing in England like the Canadian Film Board where the best of the work that I've seen from there is tremendously free and inventive, and, and uh, I've been constantly astonished by films as good and as free as Lonely Boy, for instance, or, or a marvelous film that you sh I think was shown on, on, on television here called La Lutte, the, the, about, about all in wrestling, which tre tremendously impressed us in England. Um, I don't really think we are setting as many trends as we ought to be.